Today's session, ODR Ethics and Standards, What Do They Mean to Our Practices? It's sponsored by both the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution and the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution. I'm Leah Wing, the director of the center, and I'm a member of the board and one of the co-founders for iCoder. And my colleague who's joining me in doing much of the presenting today is Dan, and I'll let him introduce. Thank you, Leah. Um, well, I'm Dan O'Reilly. Most of you probably know me already. I'm with Holistic Solutions Incorporated, which is a private mediation and arbitration and facilitation practice. Um, been um, a, a fellow of NCTDR for quite some time and had the pleasure of working on the document that we're going to talk about today with Leah for, for quite a while. I, my goal here today is to be the voice of, um, of one element of the ODR world that very often is sort of underrepresented. Um, a lot of the talk about ODR tends to be what I've referred to in the past as wholesale dispute resolution. Millions of cases going through e-commerce and going through court systems. But there's also a good number of us who engage in what I've called retail dispute resolution. That is traditional ADR practices in arbitration, mediation, facilitation, negotiation, et cetera. Uh, we're not dealing with millions of cases. We're dealing with a reasonable caseload and we're dealing with them sort of as an adjunct to a traditional ADR practice. So as we go through the standards today, Lee and I are gonna trade off a little bit. And one of the things that I'm gonna to try to talk about is what does it mean to have these standards in a practice that is not a wholesale practice, but is a retail practice where I'm working with parties in a relatively uh, confined practice uh, instead of running through millions of cases and using AI um, to help me out. So that's kind of where I'm coming from today. And I'll try to be that voice and uh, uh, Leah can, uh, can counterbalance me. Thank you, Dan. We're not alone in presenting. We are blessed to have four colleagues who are all fellows of the center and members or board members of iCoder, as well as um, leaders in ODR in the field in the last 20 years in their own right um, in their own practices from around the world. And they have been so kind to tape their contributions. So we'll be hearing from their voices and their perspectives as we go a little further along. So to begin with, I think many of us who are joining the call have been enthused about the use of technology. Um, and some certainly have come as either skeptics or with great worry about its relationship to handling disputes. And I think we can see its ubiquitous nature in our daily lives has made things better and also made things difficult in some new ways. If I could ask folks if you don't mind, if you could be sure to mute, that would be great. Um, so we, we can see that technology is it also changing the boundaries. Um, I, I point you towards a wonderful article early on that Ethan Katch and Orna Rabinovich Aini wrote um, on uh, the, the, the way in which technology is changing the boundaries of our fields of both the legal field and the dispute resolution field and other fields. And we have a, um, a, a webinar I hope you'll consider attending that's this coming Monday, um, June 13th with, um, our founder and the founder of ODR, Ethan Katch, having a discussion with Richard Suskind, um, who is going to be talking specifically about how technology um, in the future is going to be changing the boundaries of all of our professions and um, the way that humans offer their expertise. So the question is, as technology is this disruptor, as it's uh, causing changes in what we can accomplish it also can give us a chance to envision new ways of, from our perspective in our field, healing relationships, um, preventing disputes, encouraging collaboration, and delivering faster and more equitable access to justice. In, a, in the 20 plus years that ODR has existed, we already see that it has transformed dispute resolution. As I, I, I do wanna say from what I just mentioned, um, I wanna emphasize there's ability for us and ethics can point us towards that. 
to focus on the positive and ways that it can transform dispute handling even in even better ways. And it has proven to increase access to justice. I highlight here on the screen several of the ways, there are many more of course, where it's proven to reduce court backlog, which of course increases the rapidity through which we handle cases. It makes it more convenient and efficient. Um, it provides additional channels for communicating. And this makes it possible for us to work cross jurisdiction, um, cross cultural boundaries, and even participate simultaneously um, through uh, our, our different first languages. Um, it gives an opportunity for us to have system integration um, uh, between courts and other government agencies and um, even with other aspects of the, of the internet. And it can combine human and AI expertise. At the same time, it does raise risks. And these, these risks may be brand new with the addition of technology, but it also can magnify risks that already exist in the face-to-face -face world. Um, and um, there are inequalities that get exacerbated when we add technology or that are at risk for being exacerbated. And it can also create new inequalities. And so these are in many ways what we would like to be thinking about as we consider being practitioners, um, being system designers, um, and also being community members that want to see access to justice and human healing. When there's poor data and we add that to limited transparency and limited accountability, then we can have harm doing that can occur again, even within our face-to-face -face pr processes be magnified. But when we have unidentified harm doing, because we've added technology that can gather up data and that data can only be available to some and not to others, it could be misused and it could be um, misused even unintentionally in ways that can assist with um, creating inequality. I want us to think, for example, about the last 40 years and how, at least from my perspective, we continue to be plagued with the concern about the fact that we have repeat player bias that can happen. With, for example, businesses or landlords or others who end up in court regularly or in mediation or arbitration regularly, and they have a familiarity with either the third parties or with the process. They have access to perhaps more funding or more resources. And that repeat player bias may not be something that's designed into what we hope will happen, but it still manifests. So we need to think about when we add technology to that and some have more access to resources, more familiarity with including technology in the process, how might we have a process that in effect adds a kind of steroidal effect to the inequality in the process. Our dispute resolution standards across the board have a dearth of attention to technology. Um, most of them do not uh, yet deal with issues around data or data transparency, confidentiality and privacy regarding the use of technology, accessibility issues, again, related directly to technology, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and the integration with other systems as related directly to the use of technology. So we would argue that ODR ethics is not merely about having an abstract conversation about being a good person or about performing in an ethical way, which are, of course are important aspects of our practice and our profession, but also they are directly related to how we can provide services, how we can contribute to access to justice in a way that is reducing risks and is enhancing the way that technology can contribute. So one thing is just to ask ourselves, what are the new risks? And if we're not familiar with what the risks are that come with technology, what's the impact on our practice? What are the risks that in a way we are become a conduit for, not only for the parties, but even for ourselves? If we think about the question of liability and accountability, this also raises practical questions. So if I take an off the shelf software, for example, um, in order to do e-payments as a mediator um, for my practice, or I use an e-calendar to help parents um, make a parenting plan as they're divorcing. 
And that e-calendar includes a location device. What risks are raised for someone in a domestic violence situation? When I, as a court administrator, I ask someone to assist in developing an ODR system, if there's AI bias that's built in, even if it's unintentional, again, after years and years and years of AI, we still have a regular problem with racial bias in uh, AI and, and other biases as well that play out. If it hasn't been tackled outside of dispute resolution, how can we make sure it's tackled prior to its use in dispute resolution? And if our field itself does not create parameters to address that, to have standards regarding that, to prevent that as much as we possibly can, then frankly, I wonder whether it's the insurance industry that's gonna define who becomes liable for AI bias. What new protocols are needed? Again, I'd say as someone who's a mediator and a mediation trainer, I think about how will I need to incorporate new ways of having people consider the way I'm gonna use technology in my practice. Do I include that in my agreement to mediate? And turning towards the positive, if I'd like it to be both cost-effective and secure, what do I do when sometimes those two criteria actually clash? How secure is secure enough to, in order to still make it uh, cost-effective given whatever technology I'm using? How do we reduce the risk for everyone, including the third parties and the entities that manage them, such as courts or mediation or arbitration rosters? But how do we especially make sure we reduce the risk for the most vulnerable? And given all of this and so much more, what kind of training on ODR ethics is, is needed? So in our work, and again, we've collaborated with people worldwide, but so I don't just speak for Dan and myself or for either of these organizations, but as a field, um, we have uh, many, many practitioners um, and organizations have been considering these issues. And for um, NTCDR and ICODER, we have specifically tried to think about how accountability measures need to reflect at least these four areas. How tech functions across jurisdictions and sectors, how it functions even outside of dispute resolution. We need to understand that and consider that when we're creating accountability measures for ODR. We need to consider the reality of the increased risks, as I've said, for both disputants and third parties. And we need to look at the ability for us to foster access to justice and transform dispute handling in ways that are even better, rather than just trying to mirror what we've been able to accomplish in our field in face-to-face -face dispute resolution. And lastly, we need to consider how technology is probably going to move more rapidly, inevitably more rapidly, than we can build consensus around standards. And we're going to have, we already have had, due to the unfortunate circumstances of the pandemic, we've had an exponential increase in who is using online dispute resolution. So we're using it because we need to. Some folks have become adherents and they love it and other folks are still concerned, but we've, we have many more people using it and yet we have very little training and very few standards that are out there. So I just briefly, before we turn to the standards themselves, would like to give a tiny history of at least our two organizations work in this field. As I mentioned, um, Ethan Katch is really considered the founder for online dispute resolution. And um, he took his vision and helped to create um, with Janet Rifkin, the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution in the late 90s. And in 2009, the center issued its first set of ODR standards. In 2016, it issued a set of ethical principles for ODR, which are not rules. They're specifically not standards, they're values. More a set of overarching principles to consider in order to stimulate the development of best practices, of legislation, and of standards. And we hope that they're useful as you consider when technology moves more quickly than our standards can catch up to them, that we can lean on the principles for helping us determine, as Dan said, as individual practitioners, for example, how we should deal with an ethical dilemma. Um, in 2017, the center created 
the nonprofit, which is a membership organization, the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution. And ICODER was set up for two purposes. One is we wanted to expand participation in the field and we welcome all of you to join. You can go to icoder.org to join. And also specifically to promulgate um, new standards. And ICODER issued in 2017 uh, standards based on the 2009 center standards and the 2016 ethical principles. And you can imagine in the last five years, not only has technology changed and influenced ODR, but as I mentioned, the pandemic has impacted greatly both who is using technology in dispute resolution and the contributions of an enormous number of people worldwide to helping strengthen the discussion about ethics. So in the last couple months, the center and ICODER just recently have issued, we've been working for quite a long time on this, but we just issued jointly revised set of ODR standards. We continue our ongoing collaboration with the 50 fellows in the center who are uh, in 25 countries around the world and the work that they are doing in their settings, as well as our work with the American Bar Association dispute resolution section um, ODR task force. Um, and we continue to collaborate to try to um, further not only these standards, but continue to make them uh, stronger and develop best practices as well. So the standards we're about to share with you, um, we encourage you to see them as interdependent to be applied together. As I mentioned before, if we're trying to increase um, uh, security at the same time as making sure that things are accessible and cost effective, sometimes there's tension between those standards. So they need to be considered in relationship to each other as an example. And they're designed not to supplant, but to supplement other relevant ethical, legal, and technical standards. So here are the nine standards. They may look relatively familiar. They may resonate with many ADR standards that are out there, but each of them are designed specifically to address issues around technology. And you can find both the standards and the 2016 ethical principles at odr.info and you can find the standards at icoder.org. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan. Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, what we wanna do is sort of walk through each of the standards and make a couple of comments about how one might apply these or what difference they make in practice. And I would just uh, underline something that Leah said before, and that is that there is a good bit of overlap in practice between several of the, of the standards. They, they work together. They're not necessarily uh, isolated standards. So let's just sort of walk through them a little bit and talk about what they mean for us as we try to operate effectively and ethically as third parties and as creators of third party systems. But the, the first is accessible. This is an issue that's interesting because uh, what is accessible and what is not accessible may be very opaque to the third party. Uh, one of the things that I recommend strongly for private practitioners is that uh, you do a test run with the parties who are actually going to be using the systems because you may find that there's an accessibility issue that would never have occurred to you, whether it's a technical accessibility issue or whether it's an accessibility issue that has to do with technical competence or other, other issues that you might not know about. If you didn't present that technology to the parties that you're going to work with and have them tell you, yes, this is okay, I can, I can do this. Um, so I think it puts the onus on the third party to be very straightforward with and, and proactive with the parties they're gonna work with in order to make sure that accessible really is accessible. Essentially what we're doing when we create an online system, whether it's a bespoke system that we're taking whole, whole cloth or whether we're cobbling together a, a system or a virtual room out of several different applications, we're creating a virtual conference room for the parties to enter. And accessibility simply, in my mind, means that we ought to make sure the door isn't locked, that people can actually get in. And the only way to really do that is to give them a chance to put their hands on the system and say, yes, this works for me, or no, this doesn't work for me. Leah? Um, I agree with you. I'll leave it there. I'll let your voice uh, take us through some of these, and then I'll jump in. Thank you so much. Okay, sure. So uh, accountability is the second element, uh, the second standard. And to, in my mind, much of this relates to the notion of security. 
the, the bottom line is that AI, artificial or augmented intelligence, and audits are much more, uh, I won't say relevant, but they're much more uh, urgent for large systems. If you're talking about private practitioners or people who are doing traditional ADR practices using technology, there is an obligation for the individual who's creating the tech, the room, the virtual room, to make sure that the systems are accountable in a way that makes it uh, appropriate to use them with the level of risk and the level of uh, damage that might occur for the parties. And so from a, a wholesale point of view, the idea of uh, audit, auditability, the idea of uh, relative control and artificial decision-making strategies and all of that in those large systems are very vital issues. But if you take it down to a private practitioner's point of view, the accountability is, do I understand what's going on with this system en enough so that I can uh, ethically work with my parties and say, yes, you should come into this system. I should invite you in. And it's a system that we can depend on. Leah? Um, I, I want to um, highlight another resource people may find useful, especially practitioners who want to think concretely, whether, again, whether they're someone in charge of a dispute resolution process um, in a court or for an entire mediation or arbitration system, or whether they're an individual practitioner. But I'll point you towards a, a, a recent document issued by the National Center. You can get it on I, I coder, sorry, you can get it on odr.info. Um, under the publications section. And it's called um, uh, Framing the Parameters of ODR. And the reason I mention it is if you look at number two here under accountable, determination of the relative control given to humans and artificial decision-making strategies. I think that that document um, gives you both a, a, a textual description, but also a visual description. It's one way of looking at how technology um, can be viewed as layered, meaning there are ways in which we use technology where humans are almost entirely in control and we just lean on technology to assist us to accomplish a task, but therefore the technology itself is providing some avenues and shutting off other avenues. And as we increase our dependence on technology, it shuts off some opportunities. Um, about either ways we communicate or about who and what decides, whether it's humans or whether it's um, artificial intelligence. And so sometimes looking at either the visual or textual description there can help a practitioner see some of the increased risks when we depend on technology. And of course, it, we're not without risk when we depend on humans, but thinking about accountability regarding um, both ethics for when humans are accountable or when we need to consider that the technology is making decisions and shutting off other options, what do we need to do so that as, a, as, a, as an entity or as an individual to make sure that people know that this is happening and uh, are participating um, willingly, or if they're in a setting like court where they may not be participating willingly, at least they're aware of it. So I think, I hope that that document is useful. Again, it's called Framing the Parameters of ODR. Sure. Yeah, the other thing that I would say about the accountability issue, and, and especially as it applies to artificial and augmented intelligence, is that heretofore, if you're in private practice, AI has not been a, um, a, a major part of what you're using. That is going to change. There will be more and more technology that is going to rely on AI that is going to be available sort of off the shelf for mediators, arbitrators, et cetera. And so even if those things at the moment are not front and center for the way private practitioners think about uh, using technology, they ought to be at least in the back of your mind because they're gonna become more and more relevant as time goes by. Competence. This is one that, um, oops, go back one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, competence is a, is a fraught subject with dispute resolution professionals generally. Um, this is a, a, an issue that I've been talking about for a long time. What does it mean to be competent? Um, talking about competence, what, what does it mean to be competent generally? Is, is it the training that you've got? Is it the certifications that you've got? Is it the number of cases that you've done? All of those issues are 
are relevant in an ODR context. But beyond that, um, I, I think the, 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 um, the onus on the practitioner for competence in an ODR environment goes to how one chooses the technology that you use, how one understands the relative security and privacy aspects of the technology that you're choosing to use with your parties. And I think even more than that, maybe, how you can describe to the parties what they're getting into. But for me, one of the major issues with working with parties online as, as a mediator is when I present this virtual room that I've created for them and I ask them to say, yes, I'm willing to enter that, I, I think I need to make sure they understand what they're saying yes to. And part of the competence that I need to develop is the ability to understand what I'm asking them into, but also to be able to explain that to them in a way that they can actually, with self-determination, say, yes, it's okay, we're gonna do it that way. Comments, Leah? No, nope. great. Okay, confidentiality. Um, there's, this is a, another kind of a fraught issue um, because there are formal confidentiality protections that may very well be affected by where you're doing the mediation or the arbitration or the negotiation. I was recently involved in a case where one major element of our discussion was where is the place of record? Because we were in two different countries and three different states. Um, and so if something happens, um, what are the what are the controlling factors here? What what does it say about confidentiality? What does it say about litigation in the case of, uh, of issues of of people who may or may not be complying? Um, so this is this is hard enough if you're talking about a face to face environment where everybody's in the same place. But the notion of confidentiality when you add technology again it goes back to what what it relates to in terms of competence. Do I understand, for example, if I have a high risk set of information and I ask the parties to use a certain piece of technology, do I actually understand what I can promise in the way of confidentiality and privacy based on the technology that I'm using, let alone what the venue says about it, but what does the technology say about it? And so I think you, you combine these two competence and confidentiality, they're very closely related because what it suggests is that if I'm going to be a competent uh, an ethical practitioner in an ODR environment, I'd better learn very quickly how to assess the notion of uh, confidentiality and security protocols of the technology that I'm going to suggest to my parties. Leah? Um, complete agreement with what you've said. I, I again think about an individual practitioner and how as a mediator, when I invite people into a room and I meeting with both of them face to face, how a set of assumptions are there that um, prior to people being able to record on their mobile phones, we, we didn't worry as much about that. We may include in our practice now that we explicitly say in a face-to-face -face setting, we ask you not to record, but we can also see who's in the room and who's not in the room. And that changes when we get online and video, we use video conferencing. How do we know that no one else is in the room? What are we asking from the parties? What are we promising for ourselves? And how does that change our actual protocol? And as Dan says, we may need to be realistic about what we can promise, what we're committing to, and what we can say about any technology that we're using that is sucking up data or is housing data um, if we do documents exchange. So that's something that we'll wanna consider as we choose what kind of platforms we, we use. People use platforms all the time and they have relative sense of trust as they're buying and selling online as they're sharing on social media, as they're using email, and they know that they take risks, but we're used to taking the risks. And as we are now using technology more and more in ADR and in courts, then we're gonna to need to transform our thinking about how we share um, the knowledge about the risks with those that are relying on us. I would also say, if you look at the points three and four, the how data will be stored and how data will be destroyed or modified, that's, that's a very interesting question in a technology environment. Um, if I'm operating in a face-to-face -face environment where I'm using mostly paper, I can shred the stuff and, and, and say with a straight face, you know, I'm not, it won't be shared because it doesn't exist anymore. 
Um, very difficult to say that in a technology environment. And I've actually worked on cases where the choice that we've made, even though we may be using uh, web video to talk to one another and engage in dialogue, that we would actually have a courier send around hard copy of documents so that it never, never got onto any technology platform at all because it would have been so destructive if that information were, were found uh, in the wrong place. Um, that we decided that technology was not an, not an appropriate option. And so that's another thing, I think, in an ethical practice, the, the notion of we shouldn't use technology is always a, an appropriate response in some cases. And we shouldn't rush necessarily to uh, use technology where sometimes it would be better to be old fashioned. Equal. This is, a, uh, again, the notion that is very difficult to, to understand in the abstract, to me anyway. Um, how do I know that I'm treating people equally? Well, one way that I might know that in a technology environment is to see whether or not they actually have equal capability to use the technology that I'm suggesting. And the only way I can really ever assess that is to give them an opportunity to interact with me using that technology. What I generally do as a practitioner is I have two non-issue related conversations with the parties before we ever talk about their issue. I have a caucus discussion where I talk to the individual parties about what we're going to do, ask them to use the technology, affirm that they can use it well, answer any questions they've got, try to allay any fears they've got, then bring them all together and have them do everything they're gonna to have to do in the session talking about their issue. And then only after I'm convinced that everybody's on a level playing field and can use the technology adequately, do we then move to talking about their issue. That's a, that's a, a luxury that you don't always have. But if you do have it, to me, the notion of how you, how you gauge equality and access and fair treatment has a lot to do with actually having the people you're dealing with use the technology that you're suggesting to see whether or not there's any reason that you would not consider yourself that might be a barrier to either equality or fairness. So one of the things I think is important and exciting about the breaking down of boundaries, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation, um, that technology brings to us in the dispute resolution field is a fact that we can work and we ought to work, I would argue, much more interdisciplinarily. So um, our colleagues who are engineers, software engineers, computer scientists, and others have a lot to teach us. And I think we have a lot to share with them. And all of us have a different relationship with this field. Some of you will make impact on public policy, on legislation, um, and, and on practice. And I'm thinking about the power we have when we ask people to do dispute system design we ask them to create an ODR platform, or when we say we're willing to make a contract with you as an ODR system um, or ODR provider, um, what are our expectations regarding AI bias? And I think this is an opportunity, as I said earlier, for us to try to address the issue of not only repeat player bias, but artificial intelligence bias. And I would argue that when we're using technology, particularly artificial intelligence, when we have the issue of needing to address these issues at the beginning, not once we're talking only about usage. And what I mean by that is if there's no code, there's no justice. So I think we need to include a notion of equality overtly into the design, no code, no justice. Fair and impartial. Um, sort of goes back to what we were talking about a moment ago. It, to me, this relates to the notion of access, the notion of equality. Um, and again, the, the thing that I think is, is interesting about um, working in a technology environment in terms of impartiality is we have to expand the notion of conflict of interest and what conflict of interest means um, in terms of you know, d does the fact that I have now invested in a bespoke platform and I'm paying a monthly fee to use it, mean that I'm going to suggest it to you whether it fits you or not. Should I reveal that, I'm, that, that's, you know, that I have an interest there? Um, if I've engaged in 
consultation with developers or if I've engaged in uh, you know, investing in uh, development of, of applications and I'm now suggesting that you use those, should I reveal that? It's, um, it's kind of a slippery slope and there's no, I, I know of no firm guidance on when one reveals what, but the idea that the parties need to see you as being fair and impartial as well as you being fair and impartial. So the discussions that you would have in a technology environment take on a rather different character than they would if you're talking about a face-to-face -face environment because of the added elements that you bring when you bring in these elements of the, of the virtual room that you're creating. Comments, Liv? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, the legal uh, environment, uh, again, I th is one that's quite fraught in a technology environment. Um, if you think about the ethical requirement of third parties to understand the impact of legal venues and environments, that's a very daunting challenge. Um, in the past few months, I have engaged with parties in at least a dozen different venues and several countries. And I'll be quite honest with you, I could give you the top level notion of what the legal requirements are in all those places, but pressed, I probably could not give you a comprehensive, coherent description of all of the legal implications of operating any of those venues. Uh, this is a huge problem in, in my mind for third parties who are operating in the retail world of, of dispute resolution, um, because it would be very easy to miss an element, to mischaracterize an element, um, and, and yet you have the ethical obligation to at least do your best to figure out what difference it makes where you place the mediation and whether placing the mediation somewhere actually makes a difference in the legal context of the venues in which you're operating. So for me, this is maybe the most difficult ethical obligation or, or uh, standard that, that we have because of the complexity of the differences in legal environments that you might be involved in. What strikes me about this, as well as a number of the others, is I think there's an opportunity for new um, avocations and new professional positions um, in dispute resolution. Um, I, I'm wondering whether we're gonna see the burgeoning of um, activity with people who volunteer to do training for participants on particular technology, so that the third party doesn't have to be the one to teach the use of technology. Um, and here again, we may see whether it shows up as a website or as a boutique service, but I wonder whether um, there may be an avenue through which those that are practitioners who are going to be working across different legal jurisdictions can get access. And this could be another, another area of our field for growth and development. That's an interesting point. Yeah, maybe it's a, a business opportunity. Uh, security is the is the next issue, um, and I guess to me this is um, you have to be very careful about the way you phrase this to the parties, because in my belief anyway, um, I can never guarantee absolute security and privacy if I'm working online. Um, I can guarantee that I'll do everything I can to choose technology that is secure as possible. I'll, I can. I can make the uh, presentation to the parties that I've done a risk damage assessment and I've chosen technology that is appropriate to the risk and the damage that might be caused. Um, I can describe to them in a, in a reasonably coherent way the security protocols of the technology that I'm using. But in terms of guaranteeing absolute security of information, I can't do that. Um, and depending upon how you present that, it might be quite daunting for the parties. And so I think one of the challenges that you have is um, as a third party to operate with these guidelines, with the standards and to operate ethically using them is to find ways to strike the balance between absolute security and absolute openness and tie that directly to the kind of case and kind of information that you're dealing with with the parties. In a, and again, it goes back to me, in a way the parties understand. Uh, if I present to the parties a reasonable explanation of how secure I can say their, their data is, and they say, yes, that's okay, because the, the um, 
convenience that we're getting or the other advantages that we're getting for working in this environment outweigh the small risk that you've talked about. I mean, if I can present that to them in a way that is honest and they understand, then that's fine. But I, but I need to make sure that, that my presentation of that information about security is as accurate as possible. And that's maybe to me even more important than the absolute security of the platform is how I can present that platform to the party so they know that they can use it either safely or with enough safety that fits the information that we're dealing with. This reminds me again of the interdependence between them because I'm thinking about how we can do exactly what Dan said and that is our role and our responsibility. And if we only pretend, focus on security, we may not catch the issue of the fact that for one person, for them to access this, the technology we would like to use, they need to go and sit in a public space in order to do that. And so actually they, they become more vulnerable. Um, their personal life or their business issues can be overheard by others, but they can still be using a secure technology when they type or they document share. And so if we connect this to thinking about accessibility, thinking about equality, et cetera, then this helps us as we do um, make choices about the technology and also check with them as Dan has highlighted and talk to them about what it's gonna be like, not just in the abstract, but in reality to participate in our processes. Yeah, the other thing too is that, that we we have to talk about a few things in technology that we don't have to talk about face to face. In face to face, I can say to you, you know, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you don't share the information with other people. Um, but when I'm talking about technology, I also need to say things that seem obvious but may not be. It is don't put a sticky note on your computer with the with the uh, password. You know, th things that that uh, people would do out of convenience that might in fact affect the security or the privacy of the information that you're dealing with. It's just another level of things that you have to talk about. So we have one more, I think, transparency. Uh, and this is a long paragraph that I won't bother reading to you, but for me, transparency um, for, for an individual practitioner is, really speaks more, not so much transparency of the technology, although that's there, but the transparency of the process that I'm going to use. Um, and so I, you know, Anna and I have been involved in for quite some time in developing the, the universal disclosure protocol for mediation. And I, one of the reasons I found that to be important and useful is that I have found that if I approach the parties and say, okay, these are the things that we need to talk about that are going to frame how we will operate in the virtual room I'm inviting you into. And I give them a chance to say that works for me, that doesn't work for me, I'm uncomfortable with that, I really like that, I can't do that. Whatever that conversation is, I wanna make sure that as I'm inviting them into that virtual room, they understand exactly what they're getting into, they're ex exercising self-determination, and that there will be no surprises. And I do understand from a, from a, a wholesale point of view, there are other transparency issues that go to technology. But for me as a third party working with parties in a, in a retail environment, the idea of my transparency about the process I'm asking them to engage in probably is as important to me as the transparency of the technology that I'm asking them to use. Comments? You need to unmute, I'm sorry. I was just gonna add related directly to technology. I. I, I, I highlight, and it's, it's in writing here when you have a moment to read it more thoroughly, I think that being able to articulate clearly to the parties where artificial intelligence is expanding or reducing their decision-making power is important, and also how you will deal with data breaches in the event that it unfortunately occurs. All right. We ready for the next one, Dan? I think so. So, uh, so what? Um, now that we know this, <laughs> what do we do with it? Um, you know, I think the first one for, for many practitioners is the, more, the most important one, self-certify and commit to the ODR standards. And I think in, in addition to that, talk to your colleagues about the fact that these exist and that they are useful. One thing about standards is standards don't work because they're forced upon people. 
standards work because they in fact work. People use them because they're useful. Uh, it sounds sort of tautological, but you know, if, if the standards don't actually speak to the practice that you're in and, and the good that it does to your practice, then people will ignore them. Uh, these standards do speak to our practice. And so the notion of cert self-certifying and committing to them and also talking to your colleagues about them, about why you're using them is I think an important step. And of course, incorporation by entities. If there are organizations that you work with, uh, organizations that you belong to, who are, uh, that are engaged in dispute resolution or dispute engagement. You know, these are, are standards that are specific enough to, be, to give you guidance, but are also broad enough for you to be able to incorporate many different types of practice into the responses that you have for these standards. Um, and then you know, if you're lucky enough to be involved in system design and developing systems and uh, being in a position to be a um, a programmer or a developer who's offering systems to other people, um, apply these overtly to the system designs that you're engaged in. Make it part of the package that you present to the individuals that you're working with so that you're sort of hard baking into the technology that you're creating the notion of these standards and the ethical use of these standards. Um, and if we can do all three of these things, then uh, we'll have as close to a universal set of standards as you can possibly get. And Universality, as everyone knows, is really difficult, but um, uh, broad acceptance is really important in uh, using the standards in dispute resolution. I would just add to that the fact that we, we, we had a drafting committee with people from uh, all different regions of the world, and then these were approved by people, as I said, from a wide variety of countries around the world. One of the things we considered also in our conversations with the ABA and our other colleagues around the world is the desire to make these thin enough and broad enough that they can also be interpreted as need be in different cultural settings where there are different legal jurisdictional requirements. And um, so we hope that they're useful. They're really seen as the floor. They're not a set of best practices. They don't provide all the guidance needed, but we hope that they are useful and we are assuming that they will continue to need to be revised. What I'm gonna do next is show you our final slide, not because we're ending, because we have our contributions from our four other panelists, but so we're done with it. Just lost your audio. So that you can at least see how you can contact Dan and I, and also where you can find copies of the ODR standards at odr.info and icoder.org. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and Dan, turn it to you to play our video contributions. Okay, we'll see if I share a screen whether it works. <laughs> Okay, let me roll this, and if there's any problem with hearing it, let me know. Why is it important to have widely accepted set of ODR ethical standards? We know that no business may be conducted without rules and codes. Codification is doubtless needed for transparency purposes and for harmonizing practices to a certain extent. This has led the district resolution practitioners to establish a wide range of best practices, checklists, guidelines, protocols, standards, and so on. The need to streamline some practices is uncontested, considering the numerous players. They constitute an indispensable guidance for practitioners from a multitude of cultural and legal backgrounds in an attempt. So Dan, I think we're Dan, I think we're losing sound. Uh, we lost sound altogether. Is that what you're saying? Yes, we did. Um, I don't know why, because I was still hearing it. Um, let me back up a little bit. Can you hear that? Yes. These tools are meant to facilitate the work of practitioners involved 
in any aspect of dispute resolution services and systems design and spare them the effort of reinventing the wheel. Standards offer the benefits of consistency of practices, predictability of processes, cost-effective procedures, and enable practitioners, when, whether newcomers to the field or not, to navigate properly in this environment. In an age where practitioners are short of time and are faced with a plethora of documentation to read, putting in place helpful guidance and establishing some harmonization is invaluable to ensure that basic issues of dispute resolution services and systems design procedure are duly considered. Although best practices and standards have no binding effect, they are usually referred to as soft law instruments and do carry some authority. The utility of standards should not be undermined. They offer a summary of issues to be verified in order to make sure that all appropriate actions have been undertaken and ensure that a minimum set of practices are properly applied and mistakes avoided as much as possible. Standards avoid bad surprises when practitioners operate under the assumption that everybody knows the rules of the game. So we hope that the ODR standards will become to many a key tool for dispute resolution services and systems design. Standards, the foundation of ethical or real practice, are the easiest. Standards are the foundation, the base on which some structure rests. And standards show the norm. When an ODR practitioner needs to know how to act, they go to ODR ethical standards of the professional. When an engineer needs to know what boundaries he or she needs to apply to the programming of the platform or programming of the system or tools that he or she is developing, go to OER standards. Standards are the base to discern what action is ethically correct in a particular situation. So they really show the way. Why are standards important for the user? Standards protect the user, they give user information and methodology when to complain, and how the violation of the standards can be declared, examined, and treated. So, yes, standards are very important for the user. Standards in the OBR world need to be global because the world is using the technology of information and communication without boundaries. OBR standards are the DNA for the development of the field of online dispute resolution. If at the same time standards are global, uh, they also need to have local local boundaries. For example, in the Portuguese system, World standards of the NCPDR and IHD ODR will define for some countries where they need to start, and for other countries, they will uh, define how to respect the less privileged people that, by ignorance, can have a negative impact of ODR in their lives, for example. OVR standards need adoption from all the community to be recognized and used and meaningful for all the stakeholders uh, of uh, online district resolution. And congratulations to NCPDR and ICDR to show the way. It's possible to be together on this important matter for the development of OVR. And 
will you be the next organization to join NCTDR and ICODR online district resolution standards or together standards are more than what? That's uh, what I believe. And will the OER community be able to do what the ADR community has never used to do? <laughs> Meaning the by defining a set of standards that can be used by all the organizations around the world? I hope so. Thank you. Ethical standards are important because they help us to create trust. Ethics, of course, make the world a better place. And our decisions to embrace technology in dispute resolution is not only to create positive impact, but also to improve access to justice. The ODR Africa Network is an academic and for profit social platform um, established to improve access to justice in Africa by the use of technology. It's a platform where practitioners come together to exchange ideas and learn ways in which technology can be deployed to not only improve access to justice in Africa or beyond. We at ODR Africa have used the ICODA standards as a benchmark to um, assess existing standards. Consumer protection agencies world over are very interested in protecting consumers. The FCCPC, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Agency or Commission, FCCPC, is um, the foremost competition and consumer protection authority in Nigeria. And, and the FCCPC, in the quest, of course, to protect consumers in Nigeria, which uh, has about 200 million people, um, created an application. And this application is to enable Nigerian consumers to get redress from uh, complaints over products and services. Prior to the creation of the app, the commission received about um, 700 to 1,000 complaints in one year. Complainants or consumers had to visit the offices of uh, the commission to make their complaints. The co commission also received complaints by email or by telephone. But this was definitely very slow because as at, uh, with the creation of the app and as at the beginning of um, 2020, the um, FCCPC actually received about 1,000 complaints in one week, as opposed to about the same number that they received in a year prior to the creation of the app. And so what we have done at OGR Africa is use the ICODA standards to benchmark the um, app. And um, using the ICODA standards, we see that the app has made um, access to resolution of dispute more accessible and it's easier for the consumers in Nigeria to find. So consumers do not have to physically visit the offices of FCCPC. Nigeria has a, land, a large land area. The FCCPC, because of lack of resources, could not have offices in every state. And so they had regional offices, but with the creation of the app, um, complainants or consumers nationwide who have access to the internet, whether through their telephones, the mobile um, telephones or their computers are able to assess 24 hours of the day, seven days of the week, um, this um, dispute resolution platform. Of course, um, because not only the that the commission continues to have oversight functions, but because the uh, retailers immediately or the businesses immediately have notice of um, the complaints from the platform, we see that uh, this system allows for accountability. 
because the consumer sees in real time the progress and is able to track the process, the progress of the complaint. The businesses also receive the complaints immediately. The FCC continues to have oversight over this. And so this um, platform is actually self-accounting in line with the ICODA standards. It's a uh, competent and it's effective, just like I have said. Um, now they are able to um, get more complaints in and deal with them properly. It's also a platform that is confidential, so you have no business with other people's um, information. You log in and then you are able to just stick to um, your complaint because you're only able to get access to the complaints that you have. Of course, it's legal and it's secure because it's within the confines of the, the Nigerian law for the Nigerian consumer, since it's also an agency of the government of Nigeria, which is a regulatory body for uh, businesses providing consumers. Um, in essence, the ICODA standards uh, have been greatly beneficial to our work at OGR Africa because it enables us not only to educate our members as to the use of standards and to what to look out to, but it also allows us as an organization to actually benchmark and assess platforms that are put out in for the general public. We will commend the efforts of the NCTDR and the ICODA team for this. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you for this excellent webinar. Um, and thank you very much for um, putting this webinar together, Leah, Dan, and everyone uh, at the NCTDR. Uh, today, I'm going to address you on the um, ODR standards. Um, in general, standards play a critical role in ensuring the safety, quality, and reliability of products, processes, and services. Standards generally define the quality and minimum requirements for the proper functioning of the system, the rendering of the service, and indeed, the production and release of a certain product. More specifically, in the context of ODR, standard creating and setting is the process of issuing and implementing standards for the greater good of the ODR field. And it is ICODA being the leading organization and the voice of the ODR world that created and set these standards with the aim to achieve the greatest degree of flexibility, reliability, trustworthiness, efficiency, and effectiveness of ODR processes. In a nutshell, the idea is to provide a reliable basis for users of ODR processes and services to share the same expectations about ODR processes and induce global trust in ODR at large. These standards support and promote innovation by creating a common framework and understanding of the fundamentals of ODR services. It is in this spirit that I called or identify and set nine quintessential and crucial standards, namely accessibility, accountability, competence, confidentiality, equality, fairness and impartiality, legality, security, and transparency. The standard that I chose to address you today is accountability. The reason being is that stand, this standard encompasses almost all the others. Without accountability, the field of ODR would be chaotic, would be a mess. It would lose the trust and confidence of users. The growth and proliferation of ODR services across the globe has all the more required the necessity of accountability as an important aspect of ODR systems. ODR systems must continuously be accountable to institutions, legal frameworks, and communities 
and users that they serve. All the art platforms must be auditable and the audit made available to users. This will include human oversight of traceability and originality of documents and communications, and to ensure that the artificial intelligence employed is functioning properly. Determining the relative control given to human and artificial decision-making strategy. Considering outcomes and being accountable for it. It is also important as part of, as part of the accountability to have the process of ensuring available outcomes to the parties. One specific area of concern is that this accountability is required to induce trust and confidence and efficiency in all the art processes at large. One can think of many situations where only our providers or platforms could be held accountable for the dysfunctioning of platforms or services offered. And it is in this spirit and respect that courts, arbitrators, or mediators, or any dispute resolvers need to ensure that the accountability is properly considered and all the art providers are, of course, held accountable for the services they are, they are offering. It is in this sense that I consider accountability to be indispensable and extremely important to, to make sure that the users get the best ODR services available in the most efficient way without fear of losing trust and confidence in a process that is destined for global success. Thank you very much. Okay, our uh, very erudite and uh, informed colleagues. So a big thank you to Marnike and Anna and Merez and Mohammed for their contributions. Um, we have a couple minutes before we reach the end of our set time. Um, I also will volunteer to stay on a bit longer. Um, we lost some time at the beginning in case there are questions. So we welcome you to put a question in the chat or go ahead and uh, just um, raise your hand and jump in uh, verbally if you prefer. Uh, I have a question. It's, uh, it's just to what's next? <laughs> <laughs> Leah, feel that one. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to I'd like to offer that back in a way to say I think that what we're really hoping <clears throat> that we don't see this as the be all end all. We see this as a signpost, a, a, a stepping stone. If I could mix my metaphors here, um, there's been work done <clears throat> clearly by the center, by the center fellows, by ICODER and ICODER board and members. But there's been work done all over the world on trying to attend to issues of ethics, again, not just morally or legally, but also for practical reasons. And so we encourage everyone to get involved in those efforts, or if they already are, to continue those efforts. And we're hoping that these NCCDR ICODER standards are useful. Um, and that, uh, as was mentioned by many people in the, in the presentations, by yourself and Marez, for example, it's really useful when we have some basis that's shared. But we assume that there may be sector-specific or cultural-specific ways to carry these out or additions um, that, are, that are needed. And this is really an ongoing conversation. As technology changes, we are going to need um, new practices. One thing I will... Uh, echo from what we talked about earlier is, I do think we need far more training. Training for practitioners that are already using um, technology and are already trained practitioners, um, but they're not trained in the application of technology. And for new, um, new lawyers, new ADR uh, practitioners, and new coordinators of programs, we need to include this in our, in our training. 
both the ethical standards, but also the uh, training and how to uh, incorporate technology and what the risks are regarding that. And I can't emphasize enough from my opinion, I think we need to reach out to our colleagues in computer science who are teaching people to do what they call human-centered software design. And they're struggling with issues around bias and equality and, and usefulness around applicability. And they're core to our work. So I think that our collaboration with them is important. There are fabulous ethical standards that were created by IEEE, IEEE, um, engineering uh, membership organization, they've got um, uh, thousands and tens of thousands of members around the world and they collaboratively built ethical standards and ours have a lot of resonance with those. But I think that the more we work with other organizations that are our colleagues, the better. Well, I would also say that in any organization that you belong to locally, anywhere, wherever you happen to be, one of the things that I firmly believe is that um, the use of technology, online dispute resolution, and the use of technology generally get almost no mention in most certification and most mediation training programs. Uh, in my opinion, a, a at least a segment on online dispute resolution, which would include the standards, should be mandatory in any certification program for mediators or arbitrators anywhere. Um, and so if you belong to organizations where you can push that idea, uh, I think it's terribly important that uh, instead of having uh, a face-to-face -face profession and an online profession that we acknowledge the fact that everybody's using technology to some degree, and we really better educate ourselves about it better than we've been doing in the past. I would also Other say, questions? if we think about the individual practitioner who may not be busy reaching out to the computer science department at the local university, or may not be deeply involved in a membership organization's you know, decision-making around ethics. I would say to individual practitioners, take a look at the iCoder and TCDR standards and see how it might be useful to you as you are making decisions about your practice. Take a look at what your typical protocols are, whether they're written protocols for what you hand out to people or about the steps you take in your practice and see where, where you're using technology or where you could be using more of it in more productive ways and ways that this can point you towards making good decisions, ethical decisions and transparent decisions that help protect you as a practitioner and also strengthen your practice, but also help the parties. Great question, Anna. Is there any other question? Someone There's, uh, Linda Seeley posted in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, if you have a quick response. I'm so um, for our folks who are maybe watching the video later, it says the Tennessee ADR Commission has invited me to present on ODR standards. I wonder if you have any thoughts on how to do this presentation in a very short time. Well, for one thing, what I would say is, Linda, I'd be happy to have a, a conversation with you, you know, offline to continue that. But Same I would, here. But so Dan as well. Um, so please feel free to call upon us. And the other thing is, what I find could be useful in a very short time is to talk about an actual practice challenge or opportunity and then connect it to um, at least one standard and then another example to another standard and show how they're interrelated because I think otherwise we could end up cherry picking which standards we wanna pay attention to. Um, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Man. Please go ahead. I was going to say, one of the temptations I would have would be to say, what could go wrong with using technology to do dispute resolution? And, you know, there are obviously many things could. So, so what would the use of these standards do to mitigate the possibility of those things that go wrong? And, and talk about it in a positive way. Uh, we can always make mistakes. There can always be things that we wish didn't happen. But as Marez and others have said, if we have a set of standards on the front end that give us a baseline, there is less likelihood that the things that could go wrong will go wrong. And that's a huge advantage to any set of standards. It gives you guidance. And again, I think I would start with, you know, there, there could be disasters, but they don't have to be. We can, we can uh, work mm -hmm. with standards to make sure that we don't have those. I will note that there's a question that Paul Embley put in. Unfortunately, I know he had to leave, but I think it's worth bringing to the larger group. It says the repeat user bias is an interesting one to me. Those people also know 
how to use the courts through regular processes because they're always using the courts. So is it just that by using technology, they can do it quicker or are there really differences that change the outcome by using technology? And I think that's a fabulous question. We're not gonna be able to answer it today, but I think it's an important question. One thing I would say is it's not just familiarity. It may be that they're, that they're used to understanding the benefits of the technology in a way that someone who's never used it before. Um, and also there can be what we might call errors or mistakes um, or difficulties that someone has. So even if they're taught how to use it, if they're, if they're in the middle of an engagement that is distressing or is that high stakes for them, that if they're not confident about using the technology, the result of that is that they could look as though they are um, not as competent as they really are in real life. And that can make a difference if you have a third party who's a decision maker. And if you think about it, this is a workplace issue around competence, if this is a divorce and an issue about who child custody and one person looks um, like they're having more difficulty participating or they're the, the use of technology is making them more stressful. I'm just trying to brainstorm some of the examples and the way in which it can actually impact the experience of the process, but also the content of what they feel they can share as well as the outcome. You know, one of the things that I tell uh, practitioners that I, that I work with is that you're probably gonna face three different types of participant in the work that you do. You're gonna have people who have no idea what mediation is about. They've never been there before. They may never be there again. And so you're starting from absolute ground zero on the process itself, not to mention the technology. Um, then you're gonna have a group of people who have been engaged in mediation before or arbitration before, uh, who may not be familiar with the technology, but will be familiar with the process. And that's another danger because they will bring their assumptions about what that process should look like to the process with you. And then you're going to have a group of people eventually who are going to not only have experience with the process, they're going to have experience with the technology. And your approach to all three of those needs to be somewhat different because of the needs those participants will have and the assumptions those participants will bring into the session that you're going to work with them in. Um, and again, it's a, it's a slightly different sort of problem than a, a wholesale approach where you've got millions of, of people coming through in a system that is designed to handle those kind of cases, but where you're dealing with individuals who may be sitting down for the only time in their lives where they're going to be in front of you, and you've not only got that to deal with, you've got the... Uh, the It looks as though we lost Dan with for a moment. His screen is frozen. Dan, if you can hear me, it sounds like you're frozen. Um, any other last question or comment? Hopefully Dan will join us back in a moment, but anyone who wants to put something in the chat or make a last comment or question? Leah, I think it would be very helpful for you and Dan to publish an article about what uh, about this conference because the examples and the explanations you have given for each of the standards were very helpful, especially for people who are not that familiar with these items. Thank you, I appreciate that um, and that encouragement. I will be sure to pass that to Dan. Um, and I would also say we are, I said at the very beginning, this is a team sport. And there were six of us on this panel and um, people contributed tremendously, not only to the group sharing today, but also to the building of the standards. And so I just wanna thank our, our fabulous colleagues for presenting. And I wanna thank all of you for having joined us today and also weathered our technology cha uh, challenges today. Thank you so much. Please take care, be safe and spread the word about the standards and help us make them stronger.